What happens when healthcare falls short for new moms? In this episode, we speak with Beth, a nurse midwife turned doula and childbirth educator who experienced two very different births. Her first was a series of frustrating interventions that left her feeling disempowered. Her second was a fast, ecstatic birth that gave her back a sense of control. Beth's story highlights a key question. How can the healthcare system better support new mothers through the life-changing journey of childbirth? Stick around to hear how Beth took back her power over her birth experiences, learned to advocate for herself, and now provides guidance to other mothers looking to do the same. Before we dive into today's heartfelt conversations, I'd like to announce this episode is made possible by Baby Tula, a company that believes in something we talk about a lot here. That showcasing each mother's distinct and unique story has the power to inspire other mothers to do things in a way that feels right for them. If you didn't know, Baby Tula makes these beautiful baby carriers in nearly every color, design, and fabric that you could think of. Intricately hand-woven fabrics, clean linen neutrals, or fun colorful patterns. If you are looking for something that makes you feel more like you after having a baby, there's Tula. I've had the pleasure of working with Tula Carrier, and let me tell you, their dedication to supporting mothers aligns perfectly with our mission here. They want mothers to feel empowered, comfortable, and confident in their role. They have a program called The Fringe that selects families across the world who have beautiful stories to share about their parenting journey. From before their little ones were born through the early stages of babyhood and how they grew as a family together. If you want to be inspired by real families who are finding ways to create a new world for their children, visit their site, check out their beautiful carriers, and sign up for their email. Babytula.com, where self-love doesn't end at parenthood, it just begins. Thanks for tuning in. Now let's dive into today's inspiring story. The Golden Hour Birth Podcast, a podcast about real birth stories and creating connections through our shared experiences. Childbirth isn't just about the child. It's about the person who gave birth, their lives, their wisdom, and their empowerment. We're Liz and Natalie, the Golden Hour Birth Podcast, and we're here to laugh with you, cry with you, and hold space for you. Welcome to the Golden Hour Birth Podcast. I am your co-host, Liz. And I'm your co-host, Natalie. And tonight we have Beth from Wisconsin on. Thanks so much for joining us, Beth. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. So if you want to go ahead and tell listeners a little bit about you and your family. Yeah, so my name is Beth Connors. Um, I am married to my husband of almost five, or actually it's over five years, almost six years. Um, we have two little girls, um, three and a half and 17 months, and I am in Wisconsin. So I am a midwife as well. Um, I am a childbirth educator and a doula. Um, so not currently practicing in the hospital right now, but I am a certified nurse midwife. So I am able to practice in all settings. Um, but I've kind of switched in the last year and a half after having my second baby to um, supporting moms in whatever birth setting they want as more of a, a doula and childbirth educator. So that's what I'm doing right now the last year and a half. I love it. So much under that umbrella. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to kind of go into starting a family and then like what your first pregnancy was like. Yeah. So people would pre- like always question me when we did start our family because I was in nursing school. Um, so I was younger, um, and my husband and I had been married for a few years, both in graduate school. Um, I was in nursing school and we decided that we wanted to have our kids when we were younger, um, no matter where we were in our lives. So I was in nursing school, um, finishing up nursing school, um, January of 2020. And we had my first daughter, um, and like, we didn't have trouble getting pregnant or anything. We were very blessed in that way. Um, so things happened fairly quickly and, um, I, Gave birth to her six months before I graduated from nursing school. Um, but that experience was not at all what I expected it to be. Being in nursing school and feeling like I had like an edge on other people that maybe didn't know anything about medical care. Um, I was in a maternity care class, actually, that we were learning the same, the same things that were going on in my pregnancy, like week by week. It was like worked out that way. So I thought for sure by the time I had my baby in January that I would just be ready for anything. Um, And I was prepared with hospital birth classes and reading books and things, but then everything kind of unfolded in ways that I wasn't necessarily expecting. So that was a surprise for sure. Yeah. Um, How was your pregnancy overall? Like, how were you feeling? 
yeah, I felt I felt great. Um, low, low risk, no complications, anything like that. Um, was doing crazy nursing school hours. So um, was was really fine. Um, yeah, I didn't have any issues there and went up until uh, actually it was like a few weeks I had off of winter break. Um, and then I had her within the first couple weeks of the the winter or like the first semester, the spring semester. Um, so that was a little bit challenging trying to jump back into school. Um, but yeah, made it work out. And um, even despite all the things that happened, which I can definitely talk about too. So I was um, like, I wasn't, so I was in nursing school and I was commuting. So it was a two hour drive to class. And the day of my um, it was only like three times a week or two or three times a week. Um, so it's kind of like a part-time gig at that point. I um, was like a hybrid, but I always arranged for my prenatal appointments to be like on my way to class because it was like the halfway point of where I was. Um, so it was like a 50 minute drive to my prenatal appointment at 39 and six. And I was seeing a midwife at the time and I loved her. She was great. Um, and actually just a few appointments before that, she had told me that she doesn't do deliveries. She only sees clinic patients. So that was like a red flag at that point, but we were just going to stick with it because it was only a few more weeks. But I got there at 39 and six and um, she asked me, everything was normal. I was feeling like tightening in my belly, um, no pain, no contractions, no signs of labor with my first baby. So I really didn't know what to expect. And she's like, can we check your cervix? And I'm I'm like, no, I, I don't want that. Um, I feel like that's not something that I necessarily would need until I go into labor. And she kind of, we talked about it for a little bit. And she's like, are you sure? Like, it's just nice to know where you're at. You're almost at your due date. Um, my, I think my induction was already scheduled for some time in, at 41 weeks. Um, so she kind of wanted to know where I was at. And I just was going to be that compliant patient and agreed. And she checked my cervix and I was almost seven centimeters um, without a single contraction. I had no idea anything. Nope, no idea. And that meeting that I was supposed to go to was a preparation for the NCLEX, which is like that nursing board examination. And they said if I, my school said if I didn't attend that class, that I, <laughs> that I couldn't take the NCLEX when I wanted to um, in a few months. So I would have had to wait like an extra six months. So I was determined to go to that class. So I remember asking her, like, can I just go to that? You know, it's an hour drive. Can I come back? Um, whatever. And she said, absolutely not. You have to go into labor and delivery. And um, we're going to get you all hooked up and you're going to have this baby tonight. And that was like at, um, I want to say it was like four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, so I was admitted. My husband was also in graduate school and he was over an hour away as well. So I call him. I'm seven centimeters. And of course, like we knew a little bit, a little bit. So we knew we only had to get to 10. So I was definitely over halfway there. Um, and so he's rushing. We didn't, I didn't have anything packed. Like I had no idea. So he stopped. Um, he stopped at the at our apartment. He got the bag. We actually um, had a rabbit at the time that like we had. He had to like go give to somebody else. So he took the rabbit to my parents' house. Um, so that was like his priorities at the, at the time. Um, and then he got to the hospital, and they had um, already given me my IV, uh, hooked me up to the monitor, and then as soon as he got there, they broke my bag of water because they said you're already dilated. Like let's just have a baby. Um, I think I labored for like 10 hours more after that. And as soon as I broke my bag of water, it was like an instant, like I told you, I didn't feel anything at all. And as soon as I broke my bag of water, it was like 10 out of 10, like full on labor. Contractions were every two to three minutes, um, just like really intense. And I wasn't expecting that. So it was really hard for me to like cope initially. Um, but my goal was not to get an epidural so or have any pain medication. That was kind of like what I had prepared for. And I just kind of like went, went with it. Um, and after a few hours, I kind of got used to it. Uh, it. Took me like, I think like five or six hours until I was 10 centimeters. So I for sure wasn't about to have a baby when they first admitted me. Um, but it took me some time for my body to get to 10. And then I got to 10 centimeters and they said, well, now you have to start pushing. This is the time to start pushing. Put me on my back in the bed. And I pushed for four hours, um, coached pushing legs or knees to my ears, basically just through every contraction, didn't have any different position changes, nothing like that. And that wasn't anything I had prepared for. I had just more so prepared for the breathing and um, did I want epidural? Did I not? Like there was certain black and white things I had prepared for, but not like, when should they break my bag of water? When should I be admitted? Um, do I want monitoring? Do I want the IV? All of these different things. So that was a little bit alarming because I went four hours and she still wasn't here. 
Um, and I was like, you guys are lying to me this whole time. Oh, she's so close. And it's like four hours is a long time. So at that point, they had said, well, you're tired. You need an, um, a C-section or you need a vacuum. Um, that is your choices at this point. So I didn't advocate for myself to not do either of those things. So I chose the vacuum um, because that to me at the time seemed less than surgery. Um, and then within probably 20 minutes or so, several contractions and pushes and a lot of chaos with a lot of people coming to the room, including the NICU team. Um, it was a teaching hospital. So I had about 20 to 25 people in my room. Um, and I was just I was just trying to get her out, trying not to have a C-section. Everyone was preparing for a C-section. And yeah, so that was um, how that happened. But then she came out, um, went right to the warmer to, to the, um, the NICU team. And because of the vacuum, the long labor, or the long pushing stage, um, I did have postpartum hemorrhage. I had um, severe tearing that took over an hour for them to repair. And several threatened, this threatened me several times that I was going to need to go to the OR because I couldn't sit still because I didn't have the epidural. So the lidocaine wasn't working. Um, it was just kind of like all these things that were just like happening that I had never even thought were possible. Um, and of course, like an hour goes by when I'm getting pre- repaired. I wanted that skin to skin with my baby. She was just chilling with the uh, the nurses. And I think my husband got her eventually. But um, I didn't even see her. I heard her cry, but I didn't see her. And that to me is like what sticks with me the most, I think, is that that whole experience led to me not seeing my baby right when she was born, that like moment that I really wanted. Um, so yeah, that was like the, the very forced induction. Cause I did figure out later that that was a form of induction because I wasn't in labor, even though I was at, you know, active six centimeters is active labor, um, that I technically was in active labor when I was in the office, but not feeling anything at all. So that was definitely an interesting experience that I was not prepared for. Yeah. I kind of like didn't love the fact that you were kind of just like, well, I'm just going to do my day-to-day motion. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not 39 and six. I'm just going to do it. Yeah, right. I mean, it was just, that's, that was my mindset. It was just like, she's going to come when she comes, everything's fine. And then everything really just went opposite to that. Like going, I know people go in all the time, like, you know, for a high blood pressure reading or something is shown different with baby's heart tones or something. And then all of a sudden they, they're like kind of rushed into this induction situation that they maybe weren't prepared for. Um, but looking back on it, I thought that the experience was overall okay at the moment. Um, like, you know, looking back within like the first few weeks or so. Um, and then I was in nursing school. I knew I wanted to be a labor and delivery nurse. That was why I went to nursing school. Um, and then I started doing like my internship and um, got my first L&D job. And I, I was seeing all of these women have these amazing hospital birth experiences, like low risk moms. And like they were up walking right after and they had like really no hands on, like they had this amazing birth experience that I was like, okay, my experience felt like it was a hospital birth, whatever, that's what it was supposed to be like. But I was like, no, it could have been so different. Um, And so many moms are having these amazing birth experiences, but so many moms are also having experiences like I did that it doesn't have to be that way. So that was kind of eye-opening too when I first started supporting moms um, as a nurse. How was your postpartum? It was really, really hard. Um, I was in nursing school, so I my school said that I could have, originally when I told them that I was pregnant in September the year before, so like four months before I gave birth, um, they said I would have two weeks off and the rules changed, I guess, as the new year. And they said I could have six hours off, which wasn't even a full day of clinical. Like clinical was like eight to 10 hours. So they told me I could have six hours off and I was so upset, but I was like, well, this is what I'm going to have to do. So we're going to figure that we're going to figure it out. And thank goodness I had a clinical instructor that was just so sweet. And she's like, I'll give you one day pass. So she gave me a one day pass. And it was like, uh, um, I think it was once or twice a week. I think it might've been only once a week, but like, so I got one week off cause she gave me that one pass. Um, and then the next time she said, if you can make it into clinical or, or something, it was something, it was something weird. Um, we can like fudge it a little bit. Um, so I didn't go to that day either. So on day 11 postpartum, I was back in clinical. Um, but I was in so much pain. I was from the uh, vacuum. My uh, pubis symphysis was separated and I, d- I didn't even know until I was six months postpartum because she was born right before COVID. Um, so by the time I felt like things were not going right, um, I was like, I need help. And then everyone shut down. So physical therapy wasn't taking elective things. Um, it was all surgical stuff. So I was considering going to the emergency department. 
to try to get help from somebody. Um, and nobody was helping me. And then by the time I was six months, I was like, I've been taking ibuprofen for so long and Tylenol. Like, I mean, for six weeks, it was on the hour, like every, every time I could for Tylenol and ibuprofen. And then it was like all the time until six months. And I got an MRI and sure enough, it was like starting to f- come back together. Um, so I did physical therapy and stuff. But at that point, like six months had gone by and breastfeeding was so hard. I didn't have any help with breastfeeding. I didn't know that I could ask for help with breastfeeding besides like the outpatient hospital um, services. And they were just so busy that they gave me like maybe 20 minutes and said, well, nothing's wrong that I can see. I don't know why it hurts so bad. Um, maybe go get, get your baby checked out by like ENTs or something um, and see if it's like something to do with her hers like swallowing or something I can't remember exactly what they had said and I was like well I don't think that's right so I just kind of suffered through it decided just to exclusively pump for her which was also hard being in school um but I pumped for her for almost a year um and that was like a proud moment that I did that but I would have loved loved to breastfeed and I would have loved to have support and kind of figure out why that was not working but I never did so um thank goodness I have a supportive husband and supportive family um in-laws all of those people friends um but from the healthcare standpoint of it and like the mental aspect and the school aspect it was like just so so hard and I don't realize how hard it was until like I went through it and I'm like I don't even know how I survived (laughs) um but like somehow we do like as moms we just like figure out day by day um and it feels awful in the moment but we get through it and it doesn't have to be awful um but I do feel like that's sometimes what does happen um we kind of get left behind a little bit yeah definitely wow and so why? I mean, like during COVID too, like just like less support than ever before. So that's yeah. And I like, couldn't take her out places, and I was like, "What am I going to do with this baby?" <laughs> um. So yeah, it was just like an isolating time. I know for everybody, um, for moms that had just had babies, and I'm sure for a lot of other things too. But I know for me and my my life, that was that was definitely a hard experience. Yeah. 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 You're in the medical field, but even being in that field, you don't know what the poor yeah is out there. And like, if you don't know, being right in by that, like, you know, just think of all the women that don't are in that at all. It's just like, and to only have a day off. Mm-hmm. That's just insane. <laughs> yeah I know so much we need to do so much better especially for somebody in I mean it should be for anybody obviously but for somebody that's in like the nursing field it's like I'm not trying to get like a a, a free pass or something like I didn't have a baby during school to have a free pass I just that's when I decided that it was the best time for me to start my family and I shouldn't be penalized for that so there has to be a way to integrate that a little bit better. Um, so that would have been nice to to figure that out a little bit better. Because of course, my husband, he was in graduate school and they were just like, take as much time as you need. Like you can have, you know, late assignments, like it's fine. Um, and I was like, why can't we like switch roles here? <laughs> why can't I be the one that just had the baby and yeah, and get a little bit of leeway, but at least they were very helpful for him. <laughs> Don't even feel physically normal actually my, my husband's a physical therapist um so he was in school to become a physical therapist and so like he kind of noticed like some red flags and he now working in the hospital um he works inpatient so he is seeing moms after c-sections and um they're trying to get everybody that is both part of him to be seen by a physical therapist so that's something that they're doing which is really cool um but i should have been i should have been evaluated by a pt or somebody um in the hospital or taken seriously when i couldn't you know walk from the bed to the bathroom like I have, I, I mean, I feel like I have a pretty high pain tolerance and just in that situation, I'm like, I'm fine. Like everybody has babies, like I'll get over it kind of thing. Um, But yeah, I couldn't like stand up straight, like walking to the bathroom was just really hard. And overall it was just, I felt like something wasn't right, but I also had never had a baby before. So I didn't have anything to compare it with. So I was like, no, everyone just feels this way. This is just what it feels like. And then Thank goodness I had a good second experience. And I also witnessed so many other moms have great experiences. And I'm like, nope, that was not at all what should have happened. And I should have definitely been seen before I left and diagnosed way sooner because, yeah, that was 
really hard because then I was at home. Like, why do I still feel like this after six weeks? And I remember, too, calling the the midwife office and saying, like, something's not right at two weeks. And I think I called again at four weeks. And I was like, I'm just in so much pain. Um, and I don't know why that would be. And they're like, oh, this is just normal. Are these things happening? Um, and I'm like, well, no, I don't have like a fever or other things. And they're like, it, it's just going to take a few weeks. And I'm like, OK, I, I, bye, I guess. I guess. So, yeah, that was hard. So you said that you were seeing like during your prenatal at a midwifery office. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So she said that she didn't actually take um, due to her schedule. She was only doing clinic stuff. So she was seeing like gyne patients in the clinic and then doing prenatal visits. But I had never met with a doctor um, during my prenatal care. And I think that was I don't really remember that very well, but I think I remember being OK with that because I knew that the hospital that I was with, I was going to give anybody random, no matter who I saw anyways. So at least I would have a midwife in the clinic prenatally. I think that was kind of my logic behind it at the, at the time. Um, but yeah, I just got like a random person, a ran obviously a random nurse, but then the nurse changed. I loved her. And then the nurse changed at, sh at shift change and I got somebody that I didn't really vibe with very well. Um, so that was hard. Um, but then, yeah, the doctor that I had, it just kept changing and then residents kept changing and everyone's fingers were inside of me like, oh, your baby has hair. Oh, your baby doesn't have hair. And I'm like, I don't care. I don't care about this. I just want her out of me. Um, there was somebody sitting on my couch at a certain point, like coaching me to push. And I'm like, I have no idea what's happening right now. Um, but yeah, it was a whole party in there and people had no idea. I didn't know who anybody was. Lights were bright, like the big bright lights were on me. And yeah, it was, yes, it was not at all what <laughs> I would have expected it to be, I guess. But also I didn't know what to expect. So I just didn't even, you know, ask for anything differently. What is I know? Talk about your see it. We'd love to hear this first story. Yes. So lots more positive in this one. <laughs> Thank goodness. Um, but she, I had four days after I graduated midwifery school. So another school baby. Um, we weren't sure if she was going to come before I graduated or if I was going to graduate first. But um, I was, I did. Yep, I did. I went from one to the next. Um, and that was actually because as a nurse, um, I I wanted to, like, my, my main goal was, like, I wanted to help moms. I wanted to be that voice for them. So, so after I had that experience, I mean, I knew I wanted to be a labor and delivery nurse. But then after that experience of my own, really solidified that something needs to happen. There needs to be more advocates for people. Um, and I became a labor and delivery nurse. And then I was like, okay, but there's still providers and other people that, um, nurses, I, I have to do the things under their care that may, I maybe don't agree with or maybe want to speak up more. And I was like, you know what? I really need to be like a provider in that role. Um, so let me go to like, I want to go to midwifery school. I want to learn more. How can I help? Um, so yeah, I went right straight to midwifery school after that. And then I can talk about later why I'm not doing that path anymore. <laughs> um, but yeah, so she was, I can't even remember how many weeks I was with her. I was 40 and two, I believe, um, with my second daughter. And she, let me think. She, um, I, I was with a different group of midwives at this point. So I had actually worked with them as a labor and delivery nurse. So I knew all the midwives, which was different, but they actually um, were on call. So I knew all of them. So whoever happened to be there at my delivery, I would know who they were. So that was reassuring. Um, but I went in at 40 and two. Actually, I think I went in before that regular appointment, same, same deal, like 39 and something. Um, and I was like, sorry, let me back up. <laughs> um, so I, I never mentioned either that my first baby was almost 11 pounds um, when she was born. So she was a very large baby. I kind of I kind of missed that, missed that point, but she was a very large baby. <laughs> um, so she was om almost 11 pounds. So actually, when I got pregnant the second time um, from the very first appointment at like 11 weeks, they had me take the glucola drink. And I didn't even know really why at the time I just was being compliant and they're like well you might have had gestational diabetes that went undiagnosed um so we're gonna do it again like twice this pregnancy and I was like whatever if that's the, that works um so I did that was negative everything was fine and um they had from the very beginning even though that they were midwives and I loved them um they were kind of like fear-mongering fear-mongering me to believe that my baby was going to be huge again and that I was going to have trouble delivering her and that I was going to need to start at 30 weeks doing like the um, chiropractic stuff to help my body get into alignment. Um, and then 
potentially have an induction at 39 weeks. That was already implanted in my brain when I was like 11 weeks pregnant or 10 weeks pregnant, whatever that first appointment was. So that was a little bit shocking to me at first because I had never really even thought about it. I was like, I had an 11 pound, a pound, 11 pound baby vaginally. Um, whatever happens this time, it's all going to be fine. Um, so that's kind of why I said at 39 weeks when I had, when I was 39 weeks with my second baby, I went into the clinic and I actually agreed. I pretty, I'm pretty sure I asked for a cervical exam because I was like nervous. I was like, if I go over 39 weeks when they were going to induce me, um, I'm going to have a shoulder dystocia. My baby's not going to be okay because she's going to also be so big. Um, Because the first time I wasn't worried about that because I had no idea what how big she was going to be. But now the second time I was like, okay, now she's going to be bigger because second babies are supposed to be bigger. Um, So that got me a little bit nervous. So I had her check me and I think I was like five centimeters at 39 weeks again, like just very far dilated. And she was like, she was like, you, she's like, that's fine. That's fine. I'm like, okay, really? Like, that's fine. And she's like, yeah, it's fine. And I think I was like that for almost a week. Um, I went back at 40 and two, or maybe it was like four days or something. I ended up going back because I had been having contractions. And at 40 and two, she checked me again because we were going to do a membrane sweep. Because again, I was a little bit nervous about um, her being big, um, which I would have changed if I would have gone back. But um, I ended up being seven centimeters, no contractions, like just walking around at seven centimeters. So that's what my body does, (laughs) apparently. Um, But she told me that I could go home. And that was like my plan. We had talked about it. I was like, if this happens again, I'm going home. If I'm not in labor, I'm going home. Cause that's kind of what started that cascade of intervention. So I went home, um, at seven centimeters and it was like seven o'clock in the or eight o'clock in the morning. Um, and she said, if you ever want to come back today, tomorrow, just call and you can have an induction for advanced dilation again. And I said, okay, at least I have the choice. Um, but at that point I was like, I was done. Um, being pregnant and I had my little one at home, like just excited. My other little one at home, she was like two and a half at the time. And I should have waited, but I didn't. I went in for an induction at one o'clock that day because they had an opening and I was like, okay. Um, and I get there. It was like, we were all prepared. My husband wasn't in school at the time. We were just, we went in together. Childcare was good. It was all perfect. Um, I got there and they did their mission questions I was GBS positive, so they started me on antibiotics, I think, right away. I probably right away. Um, And they started, like, the induction, I guess, at 5 p.m. by breaking my bag of water. That's all they had to do because I was seven centimeters. And I remember being so nervous for them to break my bag of water because I remember the first time I was like, okay, they're going to, I was like, I was like, I made the wrong decision. I was like, kind of freaking out at that point. Like, I should be at home right now. Um. But I did. I went forward with it. They broke my bag of water at 5 p.m. And again, everything just like intensified really, really fast. Um, And I was hooked up to the monitor when they did the breaking of the bag just to make sure baby was okay and tolerated that okay, which was fine. Um, And there was like this really big like boom, boom noise. And I could just feel her just drop. And I was like, okay, all of a sudden (laughs) something's happening. Um, I was like, I need to stand up. And I stand, I stood up and I think I had three contractions. And I looked at my husband and I was like, I need the epidural. Like, this is not happening. I don't know what I did the first time that it worked out, but I'm done. And those words came out of my mouth. And the next contraction, I said, oh, she's coming. And literally within 45, I was actually part of a water birth study at the hospital. So the midwives were having this water birth study. They had just finished filling up the tub. Like, I was planning just to be there all night laboring. Um, And I was like, I need to get in the tub right now if I want to have like a water birth. And jumped in the tub, next contraction, she's like crowning. And within 45 minutes, this baby just <laughs> shoots right out. Um, she was crying before she was even completely delivered. Um, and I was just like overall in shock. I couldn't even believe what was happening. Just I'm pretty I was very vocal. I remember that. I was like, I was out of control. <laughs> like I was just not believing what was happening. Um, I had like my labor playlist, like ready to go. Like, I, you know, cause it was a controlled environment. It was like an induction. I was like labor playlist, playlist ready, ready to go. Like all the different tools to like help with pain management. And that just all went off the window. It was not at all what I had expected, but yeah, she came so fast. Cause I was already at seven centimeters and the only thing holding her back was that bag of water apparently. Um, and yeah, it was an amazing delivery where my husband was there. The one midwife that I had seen in the clinic that I absolutely loved, she happened to be on call. 
um, until 7 p.m. that night. And I was like, if only I could have this baby by 7 p.m. Like, haha, that will never happen. Um, and it was 5.45. Yeah. Um, but it was just her and my husband and a nurse that was in there. But lights were, it was dark. Like everything was how I would have wanted it to be for many hours if I would have kept laboring that way. But um, got her skin to skin right away, held her and got out of the water, got into the bed, delivered my placenta. Um, she asked me like when I could cut the cord or when, like, when my husband could cut the cord. And um, everything was like my choice from the time that I was admitted to the time that my baby was born and then afterwards. So it was just such a more, I know it was quick. And some people are like, you had such a quick labor. That must have been so easy. And I'm like, I don't know. That was pretty intense for 45 minutes. Um, yeah, it was quick, but um, it was just, yeah, a different experience for sure. And yeah, it went so much, so much smoother just having those choices. And even if it would have, I tell myself too, like, even if it would have gone the same way as the first one, like, I can't even be upset about it because it was my decision. And I feel like it was just so much more of an empowering experience because I went home and then I decided to go back versus just like, I don't know what's happening to me. Everything's happening to me. So that was really just like a much more easygoing feeling. Are um, water births legal in your state? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So that's something that they're trying to have in the hospital systems around here. Um, I think there's like two more years of the study and then the hospital system is going to like move it to the next hospital. And so it's really something that moms want and it's like a really safe, effective way for pain management. So I really hope it's more, yeah, more common. She was nine pounds, two ounces. So she was a little smaller. <laughs> she felt so tiny. I was like, oh, she's just a tiny little thing. I even felt like my the first thing they said when my first daughter was born was, oh my gosh, she's the size of a three-month-old. And I didn't even see her for a while after, so I was just in shock. And when I got her, I was like, oh, she's the tiniest, cutest little thing. But like now I see babies that are like five, six pounds. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I had two of you inside of me. <laughs> it's like you were a twin. Yeah, they were both about the same. Yeah. And I wasn't a gestational diabetic in either pregnancy. Um, I was a big baby myself. I was nine pounds. So I don't know. So how was postpartum with two? Also, did you your pubic symptoms kind of healed by the point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, yeah, no problems after that. Once it was, once it was healed, it was fine. I didn't have any, thank goodness I didn't have any problems either. Like at the end of my pregnancy, I never felt any like, like really uncomfortable pressure or like pain or anything like that. So that was, yeah, definitely. I know some people struggle with that. So that was something I did not experience. And then, yeah, postpartum, um, I didn't have like postpartum Pitocin or um, like breast breastfeeding went a little bit easier um, because I had support. It was still difficult, um, but otherwise, like the experience itself was so much more calm, and I feel like I knew what to expect. I didn't have any pain, so I, I was ready to go home like an hour later if I could have. I was like, okay, let's just go home. Let's see my other. I want them to meet each other. Um, I didn't, but <laughs> I could have. I felt like and. Yeah, overall, it was just, you know, it was a really great, like, experience, memorable. Like, I remember everything from labor, delivery, postpartum with my first. I think I just blacked everything out. Um, so, yeah, it's, like, fun to have those memories. And So did you end up practicing midwifery after you delivered and graduated? I actually didn't. I So I graduated in May of 2022. That's when I had my daughter, too. And took the, my exam like the next month, like a couple weeks postpartum. Um, so I was like officially able to be a midwife. And then I like really like reflected on like really what I wanted during that time off like with my daughter thinking, okay, well, when I hit like 12 weeks or whatever, however many months I feel ready, I'm going to start looking for jobs. And I started looking for jobs and I was just like, I don't feel right now that that is what I'm like called to do. I feel like I wanted that one-on-one -on -one connection with moms. And I wanted to be able to, the reason why I got into midwifery was because I wanted to see them when they found out that they were pregnant or if they were trying to get pregnant, get that positive pregnancy test, go throughout the entire journey with them together with that their whole pregnancy experience, deliver their baby with them, and then support them postpartum, make sure that they're okay, and then just be there for them if they need extra support. And as a midwife practicing in the hospital, the experiences that I have had, you're part of a practice, you know, you, you you encourage moms to see everybody. So if there's 10 midwives, they probably only see you once. And then whoever's on call is the one that delivers. So the connection just isn't as strong as something that 
I would have liked to have in my own experiences and that so many moms are looking for is that continuity of care. So I was like, I'm going to start just supporting moms virtually is where I started um, on Instagram. It was just like texting moms just for free. Like, what can I help you with? I'm trying to see what they could what they could benefit from. And I um, just got a lot of like knowledge that way of like what moms are looking for and then started to do some like one-on-one coaching and some virtual doula support and just took everything that I learned as a mom myself going through pregnancy and birth twice and then being part of like over 200 maybe deliveries and many more moms um, than that than just the deliveries but just learning from all of them um, created a comprehensive online birth course so moms can take that self-paced whenever they want just to be a resource for them um, and I have different services too for like texting me like being just you know you know how you go into google and you like try to find something information about something and you get like the worst case scenario and the best case scenario um, and you're like what do I do with this now it's like really nice for moms before and after prenatal visits even just to have somebody talk to them and like somebody to message that knows who they are and like can actually like either talk them down that it's not as bad as they think they are or like know there's something that maybe we should be concerned about and like reassure them that they're not crazy for thinking these things and maybe to get checked out or something so really just supporting moms wherever they're at in terms of their pregnancy or labor or postpartum just talking to moms postpartum and figuring out like mental health stuff and um, providing really a lot of resources for different things so um that's what I think is a lot of times missing is that referral network too of like, well, where do I go from here if this is happening to me? Um, and that's been helpful. I guess my biggest piece of advice is just knowing that you have options and knowing that your birth experience is whatever you want it to be, not necessarily what other people are telling you that it should be, whether that's your provider or family member like your mom or something. Um, it's really about you and what you feel is best for you and your baby and becoming educated about all the options that you have and ultimately making the decision for yourself. Um, so yeah, if you want to connect with me, I'm mostly on Instagram at Beth Connors underscore CNM. Um, and you can find my website, uh, BethConnors.com. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing your stories. Yeah, I'm just really happy that you had that like Second empowering earth because I just had a girlfriend go through. Um, she like had a beat back and it, it's just like it's just like that. I'm taking the power <laughs> totally. Yeah. And the goal really is to have every mom have that first good experience. And like let's just not even have that <laughs> you know, that doesn't you don't have to have it's not a prerequisite to have a, you know, bad experience in order to have a good one. So trying to to change that for sure. Thank you so much. Yeah. For meeting you. Yeah, thank you guys. We'll see you next episode. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Golden Hour Birth Podcast. We hope you've enjoyed our discussion and found it insightful and beneficial. Remember, the Golden Hour Birth Podcast is made possible by the support of listeners like you. If you appreciate the content we bring you each week, consider leaving us a review on your favorite podcast platform or sharing the show with your friends and family. Your support helps us reach more people and continue creating valuable episodes. If you have any questions, suggestions, or topics you'd like us to cover in future episodes, we'd love to hear from you. You can reach us on our website, www.goldenhourbirthpodcast, or connect with us on social media. We value your feedback and want to make sure that we're delivering the content you want to hear. Before we sign off, we'd like to express our gratitude to our incredible guests who joined us today. We are honored that they trust us enough to be so open and vulnerable. We're grateful for their time and willingness to share their stories with us. If you're interested in taking the conversation further with us, join us on our Facebook group, The Golden Hour Birth Circle. We'll be back next week with another exciting episode, so be sure to tune in. Until then, stay golden and remember to take care of yourself. We'll catch you on the next episode of The Golden Hour Birth Podcast. Bye!